Okay. So this slide is presenting the overview of what we are going to hopefully cover. It might be a need to cut a little bit on the lab time, um, but we'll try our very best to cover the lecture for, for these topics. Um, so um, as you can see, we are listing only a short subset of a variety of methods that you may want to use or may need to use or have learned about. We are going to talk about computing a correlation about uh, running a t-test and about linear regression and then uh, generalized linear models and its specific example of a logistic regression. Uh, the reason is that we believe that once you are getting a grip of how to run a t-test, an example of a, a bunch of different tests which are available in the software, you should be able to go on your own and be able to use the documentation to uh, mirror what we're going to show in the slides for the test of your interest. And similarly with any type of uh, regression, once you get a grip of how the basics of specifying a model and using a model look like. Uh, disclaimer, uh, we'll focus on how to use our software to do this. We will be not, we'll be definitely glossing over on the statistical the theory or so-called formulas for either the tests or, or the models. And moreover, we do not claim that the data we use for the example are the ones uh, which are meeting all the assumptions of the methods that we will be using. So for example, when we are going to touch on linear regression, um, we are not going to be commenting whether or not the data is indeed appropriate for that particular model analysis. We just show you how to use the software. And uh, there is a plenty of resources online for learning about the methods themselves. Uh, as well as you might be interested in learning about uh, biostatistics series offered at Johns Hopkins uh, School of Public Health. There are four different levels of biostatistics series classes that are available, so you may want to explore if there is something that addresses your needs. Let's start with the correlation. So to compute a correlation, uh, there is a function core, a variable in R, and you can see here the uh, part of its documentation. Uh, specifically, the correlation has the arguments x, y, and some other things we'll touch on later. We can use the correlation, the typical use of the correlation function uh, may go in a two ways. So one way is to provide two numeric vectors, which are going to be arguments x and y uh, respectively, to compute correlation between those two vectors. So you would end up with having a one number of a correlation that was computed. Alternatively, you may have a matrix or a data frame which has two or more columns. And assuming they're all numeric columns, you may be interested in computing at once correlation value between each pair of the data you are having. So for example, if you're having three columns, you would want to compute uh, one, two, <laughs> three different values of a, of a correlation. Um, the argument method is specifying what kind of correlation you want to compute, and by default, the, the first one, the Pearson correlation coefficient, is being computed, but be aware that you may want to modify what correlation you are computing with the use of these values. So let us jump into the example. In the example, we are going to be using uh, uh, Baltimore Charm City circulate, circulator data. Uh, the first couple of rows of this data are listed here. Uh, in short, we do have date and we do have information whether or not this Monday, Tuesday, etc. for information about number of boardings across different lines uh, in, in the circulator. So we can see that there is orange, 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 and then the purple starts. But when it comes to the orange, we are having three different columns. And we are going to be sticking to this orange average or purple of uh, purple average, et cetera, which is uh, perhaps the best way to estimate how many onboardings on the current day were into the orange line. So um, in the first example, we are using the function correlation and we're providing the two vectors into that. So we want to compute the correlation between the values from orange average and purple average, which is again, the number of onboardings between the orange and the purple line. So when I just run this function, you can see that the value NA is returned. It is because the function correlation works as the other functions we have seen, such as mean, 
um, max standard deviation, meaning if you are having an A, an A value within either this or this vector somewhere, the function is going to return an A. A way to handle that is to use one of the, um, is to use the use argument. And for example, it's value complete K, complete that ops, which is saying compute the correlation between the two vectors. But if any of the vector is at some element having a value NA, just discard this row from, like discard this element from both one and the second vector when you're computing the correlation. So basically truncate your data in a way that there is no missing observations in either of the vectors. And you can see that the correlation between the uh, average number of boarding over a days between the two lines is quite high. Um, like a background story is, I guess it might be related to the fact that both lines are going to have more uh, boardings during the weekdays, like Monday to Friday, versus for both lanes, you are going, we are going to see a drop, for example, of number of boardings for the weekend days. Uh, and the similar behavior is being captured with the high correlation. This is a, my a hypothesis behind what is happening here. Um, note that uh, you may try to use this information, for example, for the visualization. So this slide is combining uh, what we have seen in a previous module with what we are learning right now. So I start with computing the value of a correlation and assigning its value to this spec a variable core underscore val. Uh, here I'm doing a little bit of a uh, polishing of the result, meaning I'm going to uh, use this function paste to make a text label, which is going to have R equal sign. And here I am including in this passage a value of the correlation I computed, but I'm also using a function around to keep only the first three elements after the comma. So it's not a very long uh, line uh, is being printed. And I'm using a ggplot function on this CERG data frame, and I'm plotting the two vectors of the data that I used to compute the correlation. And I'm using this function annotate, which is um, basically telling R, okay, take this text vector that I have defined above and locate it at the point where X is equal to 2000, which is somewhere here, and Y is equal to 750, somewhere here, and plot the value of a correlation. So that would be a way of first displaying your data and indeed seeing that there is a trend between the number of boardings between orange and purple lane, but also implicitly uh, printing what is the value of the correlation that we have uh, previously computed. Moving forward, we mentioned that we can also use the whole data frame or the whole matrix to compute the correlation for all the pairs of the columns at once. And the important thing to notice is that we have to have only uh, numeric columns within a data frame if we want to use the data frame in the correlation function. So what I'm going to do here first is to make a subset of my CIRC uh, data. The subset is such I am only keeping the columns which are ending with the average. This is going to get rid of all the other columns which are describing the different lines, such as uh, there was like orange something, orange something, and then orange average. So I'm only keeping the averages, but it is also getting rid of the weekday um, column and the date column, which are not of a type numeric. So I do not want to include them. I can see that indeed I am left only with uh, four columns which are describing the average across the four different uh, lines. Um, I'm using the function core again, and I am, instead of two vectors, I'm providing the whole data frame that I have just created. I'm also using the um, argument uh, comp use complete observations, because again, within this data set, I am having a NA observations. So I would end up with having NAs in my result if I have not taken care for that. And I am assigning the results to core mat, uh, this object is colloquially uh, referred to like correlation matrix. Very often when we're having a data, uh, we may hear a collaborator telling us, show me what is the correlation matrix be between the variables. So this is an example of a correlation matrix, which is summarizing the values of a correlation between all the pairs of the, in this case, four columns we have in a data frame. So uh, what you can see is that on the diagonal, which is representing the pair between the same columns, for example, 
orange average, orange average here, or purple average, purple average, and a corresponding entry, there's always going to be a value of one because the correlation between the exactly identical vectors is equal to one. Uh, a quick note about visualization again, when I go to uh, my browser and type R correlation matrix plot, the very first result I'm going to see is a blog post or an article which is introducing the library core plot. Uh, it is the library you most likely is not going to have loaded here, but let me just say that it has this library named core plot, has a function named core plot, which is perhaps the quickest way to turn your correlation matrix into some a little bit nicer visualization. So in this case, I am using the core matrix I generated slide before. And I am also specifying that I want, only want to have an upper triangle of this matrix being plotted, and that um, there's going to be a certain order of the uh, labels of the columns being displayed depending on what, is, uh, what the function determined is a uh, reasonable organization. And you can see this like legend here indicating what is the um, value of the correlation that is being represented by this uh, dots uh, on the on the different on the different points here and again on the diagonal we are having values equal to one so just another um, uh, way of taking a look at the correlation of the of a data frame uh, now there was a lab port design but before we jump into this lab part i would actually want to make sure we go through some later part of the lecture. So we are going to skip this lab part for now and see how much time we are left at the end and come back to conclude this and the next part of the lab. So now we are going to jump to the t-test. And this slide is containing as least as explanation about the t-test as um, I thought might be um, enough slash necessary for the today's presentation. So um, you may hear about the t-test commonly in the two contexts, so-called one sample t-test and two sample t-test. So one sample t-test is used to test mean of a variable in one group. On the contrary, two sample t-test is commonly used to test the difference in mean of a variable between two groups. And just additional comment very often if um, the two groups the two sample t-test is referring to are the data of the same individuals collected over two time points. So for example, if I collected the data about your uh, mood score on Monday versus your mood score when we were at the end of the class today, uh, I do have a two sets, two groups of the data, but they are collected from the same group of folks, assuming we're having the same, exactly the same individuals on Monday and today. And such kind of a two sample t-test would be referred as a paired t-test. And we are bringing this back because this is like a common use cases. And now we are going to note that in R, there's a one function named t.test that is used to address all the above. And what I am printing, what we are printing here is a part of the documentation of the function. And you can actually see that it has a number of different arguments that we are going to use to determine whether or not we are using one sample t-test, two sample t-test, whether it is paired or not, and a number of other elements. Something to be very um, aware is that, again, there is a different types of t-test execution you might be have in your uh, in your practice one sample, two sample, paired, not paired, and there's only one function. And it is up to you as a researcher to be aware how to use the provided software to have it match what type of a test in particular you want to run. And let us, let us convert that comment into examples. So we are going to start by running a one sample t-test. Uh, one sample t-test, again, tests mean of a variable in one group. Uh, and what is happening by default, that is without us explicitly specifying a value, values of other arguments, is that we are testing whether a mean of a variable is equal to zero. And that is, um, that is indicated by a default value of an argument mu set to zero. We are using so-called two-sided alternative, which can be um, changed with the use of argument alternative. And the results of a t-test are going to that the t-test is assuming a so-called confidence interval 
at the level 0 0.95, which is given by this argument. So when I only use the function t test and only provide a vector of values for which I want to test, I need to be aware that all these things that I have just mentioned, which are important things to be aware of, are assumed by default. So you as a researcher, basically just a reminder to be aware that you obviously can use a function, but you do have to be aware what is happening under the hood in terms of the assumptions that are being done. Here we are having an outcome of running a t-test function. So it has a title, it is telling us what we have just run. We have provided one data vector, so it is going to be a one sample t-test. And it is containing uh, a bunch of information that we are not going to cover in detail other than pointing you that we do have a value of a test statistic. We do have a p-value provided. You can actually see that p-value is here essentially equal, is, is very, very, very small. And we also have alternative hypothesis stated that the true mean is not equal to zero. It is, um, uh, this statement would be different if you, for example, chose to use different uh, value of alternative hypothesis, for example, one-sided. We also have confidence intervals for the mean of the variable that we have provided, and they are 95% confidence intervals following what is the default value of the confidence level, and some other information that is not discussing them is not really a topic of this class. Uh, similarly, running a two-sample t-test an example of which we're having here is being done by providing two vectors of data. So I am here, I, I am testing whether a difference between average boardings is the same between the orange line and the purple line. And again, there is a whole list of things we have to be aware that are being done by default when we are using this function without specifying them otherwise explicitly. Um, rephrasing that again, as I really believe it is an important thing to keep in mind. We have these three things that we already commented in the context of a one sample t-test. For a two sample t-test, there are two other things which are, um, which are to be characterized. It is whether or not the data are coming from a paired experiment, and by default, it is equal to false. And also whether or not you are assuming that the true variance in the two groups is equal or is not equal. And there's also some default information that is assumed. And again, an outcome which is a similar, uh, giving you a title of the test that was run and a similar information as, as, be, as before. Moving forward, uh, you might be interested in retrieving the particular information from the outcome you have just generated. So it can be either a p-value of a value of a test statistic, et cetera. Um, to do that, we are going to remind ourselves about the concept of a named list. Specifically, the result of running a t-test function, when we assign that to a variable and we investigate what is the class of that, you'd actually see that the class is going to be something named differently than just a class. The something named differently, it is going to be a variation or an extension of a classical class. But under the hood, the result of running a t-test is just a list, which means uh, it is uh, is just a list, and specifically, it is a named list, meaning if I type names and uh, names, when I use the names function, I would be able to see all the elements I can access from this list. Specifically, I may be interested in um, pulling what is the value of the test statistics in this test. I can do that with using the dollar sign and typing the name of the statistic, which I learned from running the names result. Similarly, I may be interested in uh, pulling what is the p-value uh, coming from that test result. And this example is maybe um, it, the p-value from this test ended up to be very, very, very small, as you can see from, from this output. Moving forward, um, there is a very helpful um, package named Broom, which is having a function named tidy that can help you organize the result, uh, that can help you convert the uh, the result from running a test and, um, for example, regression models, as we will see later, into a form of a data frame. So instead of you pulling one by one the information, as we have seen in the slide before, you may have a function with that which does it for you and organize that in a data frame. So when I run fun function tidy and assign it to the result tidy, this result is a data frame. Some other statistics which are available um, are listed here. 
And again, the idea is that you have just learned what is the main, uh, what is the general way of using those tests. And you should be able to go ahead and Google the documentation of these methods, learn what particular arguments mean, and be able to run to use the software provided to execute those tests. And again, uh, moving forward for the sake of time, the part that I really wanted to get to is a linear regression and generally uh, data, basic data modeling in R. Uh, bad news is that there is like, you can have a classes like semester or like academic year long classes about studying the methods. Uh, good news is that uh, the R software, which is being used to execute these methods is following a very similar con uh, concept that we are going to learn today. Uh, basically, once you learn how to specify a model formula for your model, you should be able to go ahead and reach out for other functions that follow the similar concept of model formula specification and use it on your own. So let's make sure that we are able to cover that part. Uh, this one slide is um, presenting perhaps the absolute minimum about the linear regression that is needed to allow us later put the context of the linear regression into the usage of a software. So linear regression is a method to model the relationship between a response and one or more so-called exploratory explanatory variables. Uh, the minimal notation that we are providing here is given here. So this is what you sometimes may see in your um, biostatistics or statistics textbooks, which is describing this relationship between a response or and one or more exploratory variables. And why we are putting that here, we want you to be able to understand how this part is translating to the R software uh, model usage. So what we are having here, on the left-hand side from the equation, we typically has what is defining the outcome for a person. And on the right-hand side, we are having a list of the variables we want to use in a modeling. In this particular case, there's only one variable and so-called intercept, which is not really a variable, but like a constant that is in the equation. And so-called residual variation or a random error that is in the formula specification. Similarly, you may have a more complex modeling situation where instead of one exploratory variable, as in the previous slide, we're having in this case, three of them. And uh, how we take this, how we take your data and we take this concept of regression modeling into R, uh, starting with a linear regression. To feed a linear regression model in R, we use function named lm. So this is a part from the documentation of the function. And most typically, we're going to provide two arguments to this function. It is a formula and the data. The data is our data frame. There is not more philosophy around that. But let us dig a little bit more into this formula, which is a model formula written using names and columns of your data. Specifically, let's go back to this example. Uh, what we are having here is we are having outcome and one exploratory variable that we want to use in our modeling. That particular expression written in a like statistical uh, manner would translate into that formula in R. Uh, so what we have here, we have one, one um, characters, one element standing for the outcome and one element representing one variable we are having. In, in practice, uh, what I am having here as a toy example would be replaced with the actual names of the columns from your data set. So let's say that we want to fit a regression model where the outcome is an income from our data set. And we also have some column which is named years of education in our data. In um, other ways, something in line is trying to uh, model income with the use of years of education as a predictor. Then this formula we would use in a model would translate into such a writing. So again, on the left-hand side, we are having a name of the column, which is the outcome. And on the right-hand side, we are having a predictor. In this case, only one predictor, a years of education. And let's take 
a look now in a more convoluted example. So this is the extension of our problem in which we are having uh, three different exploratory variables. In our toy example, this formula in case we're having three exploratory variables would translate into the formula in which we are listing them separately and joining them by a plus sign. And again, translating that to the actual like practical case, um, the names of the columns in our data set would be replacing both outcome and predictors. So um, let's say that we are having an income and we want to predict that with years of education, age and location, that would be the formula I would use uh, in R. And again, what doesn't mean that would be a formula I would use in R, let's take a look at the example. The example is going to use the data set downloaded from the Kaggle uh, contest website. It is having an information about the cars, um, specifically whether or not the car was a bad buy. I understand that somebody was trying to buy a car and sell it with the profit, and whether or not the sell for the profit was successful or not, I might be wrong here. So sorry if I am um, giving some misinformation. But specifically, we have information about the vehicle age and purchase date and some other information listed here. And some part of that we are going to use in our first example. So I see that we are getting close to the time. So I'm going to make sure we are covering the core part of this model fitting. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see what's going to be there. But I'm going to try to wrap it up within like three to four minutes. So what we're having here is, again, I'm using the function LM, of which we mentioned, that is being used for uh, regression model fitting in R. And again, this function is taking typically two elements. The first element is a model formula. The second is the specification of the data set. I know that my data set is cars, so I'm providing that here. And here I'm making a formula of a very simple model. I mean, this is the model that contains only one outcome. <laughs> this is the model that has as an outcome um, vehicles odometer, which is a distance traveled by a vehicle. And it has only one exploratory variable, which is age. And I am assigning the result of this uh, function to the variable named print. And I am printing that to the console. Actually, this print here is uh, redundant. Uh, the information I'm getting here is quite limited. It is only printing me what was the call I used. So basically uh, restating to me what is the function I used to uh, generate uh, this fit object. And it is also giving me right away the estimates of a coefficients in the model. So without going too much into the details of what the re regression is, it is giving me the point estimates of the intercept and the coefficient which is standing in front of the variable representing, in this case, we call age. However, uh, I may be interested in getting a little bit more example about my model. To do that, I am using the function summary inside which I am inserting the fitted model variable fit. I am assigning that to the new variable. Um, and again, this print is a little bit redundant, sorry for that. But anyway, when I am printing the summary of a model fit, I am getting more information. And while we don't have a time to cover that in detail, typically something you would be very interested in is jumping towards this coefficient section where you are having the names of the coefficients listed as well as their point estimates. This is something we have seen on a slide before, as well as the p-value information and other information you might be interested in. Um, again, uh, feed model summary is a list. So you might be interested in pulling a specific elements of that with the use of this dollar sign and name of the list element to get the part you're interested in. For example, the coefficients or R squared information. Um, here, there's an example which is showing uh, a model fitting where we are using yet another uh, exploratory variable. So you can see that I'm actually extending my formula by using not only vehicle age, but also a warranty cost information. And now such a summary, you can see that it is going to be a little bit longer, at least with respect to this coefficient section, as it is also listing to me uh, the information about the is estimated um, coefficient for this additional variable. Um, <laughs> I can see that we are very close to the time. And I think I'm left with like a five slides. So 
let me ask the other instructors, what do you think would be the best way to proceed right now? I think you could maybe briefly go over how you could use other types of models on one slide. Yeah, sounds great. So uh, the overview of this part was we've been discussing how the factors are being treated and the factors under the hood are being split into a separate variables for which of them you would get a estimate of the coefficient. This is something you can like easily Google. But in that, what we wanted to get into is um, this generalized linear regression models, which is the family of models that you can use to model your data in case your outcome is not following, uh, is not really a continuous nor a normal outcome, but it is following, um, it is either like, um, it is either in a form of zero ones, which would bring us, which would bring us to the logistic regression, or it is the in the form of a specific counts, which would uh, allow us to use a Poisson regression uh, modeling. So the syntax for using a generalized linear regression models, where again, logistic regression or Poisson regression are examples of, is extremely similar of what we have covered. The primary difference is that the function we're using is GLM instead of LM only. And there's one additional piece that we are specifying inside, which is clearly indicating what kind of a type of the response we are having. And since that, what kind of a, a link function we are assuming in our generalized linear models. And to learn about the options available, you can type a question mark and a family uh, in our console to learn about the possible options. Some of them include, as we are mentioning, the binomial and the Poisson. And just an example of uh, demonstrating how we would use it. Let's say I want to model the outcome, which is zero one variable, which is a bad guy is an example. I'm proceeding with formulating, uh, with specifying the formula in a very similar way. But the two changes I'm making is first of all, using GLM instead of LM and adding this yet additional argument named family in which I am specifying use the uh, binomial, uh, use the link function specifying specified to binomial data. Specific, specific to the binomial data or specific to the zero one value data. The summary of the model would look very alike, but obviously the interpretation changes. And last but not least, I just wanted to, re to re reiterate that this is a researcher responsibility to first of all, understand the statistical method to use, but also to understand the software and be aware whether or not the method you are using is indeed matching the statistical method you had in mind to be sure that the results you are producing is what you had in mind. And yes, let me uh, conclude at this point and stop sharing my screen.